Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. Cesario Ramos, welcome to the Exagility podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you, John, for having me. Delighted to have you. Well, we're going to keep this snappy, aren't we? Because we've got a Champions League football match to tune into maybe later on. It's in 48 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Cesario, I've known you for a few years as a scrum.org professional scrum trainer and also as a certified uh, less trainer. I'm aware of your case studies. You don't just have one. You've actually a number of times you've managed to do less adoptions, which are not easy to do. And you've even done less adoptions in place where people would have used the Spotify copy and paste approach and you would have flipped them to an alternative approach, which you're, mm -hmm. uh, maybe hope people to explain to us what, the, what you do there. So that's really good from a credibility point of view. You're not just a trainer. You actually do this stuff and you can repeat it. You can repeat it so well that you and your peer, Ilya Pavlichenko, wrote a book called Creating Agile Organizations. And my understanding is that it's got two target audiences. Number one, people who are in a position to maybe change the organization design to actually help change and improve things in the company. But also there are some practical tips and tricks and workshops and so on for practitioners, change managers, coaches, that kind of thing. Anything I'm missing there, Cesario? No, I think that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty complete. It's, uh, it's, it's in two books. It's, it's in two parts of the book. One is the, the concepts, which is more for for leadership who have the power to redesign the organization and there, then there's the second part which is about how to actually then do it how to actually execute it how to actually facilitate sessions it's more about applying applying the concepts i think you're pretty pretty correct yes Good stuff, Cesario. Delighted to have you here. And it's no surprise, of course, that there's a big less influence in the book. A lot of the concepts would have been inspired by less, but you've probably come up with some of your own little sauce as well that you've managed to cook up for clients and help them to, to make progress. And I think the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about was teams, because a lot of people out there seem to think that agile is something that teams do. We can just get some people in to just make sure our teams do agile or whatever it is some type of agility and everything would be great apparently there are some issues with that okay so uh, i don't know which uh, angle you're coming from at the moment uh, one way to look at it is if if you only work with the teams and let's say you leave the policies and the, and the rules and the incentives and the basically components of the organization design intact and these components still optimize for other things, like things that you thought were important uh, in the past. But now you want to optimize for agility or adaptability. Then working only with the teams will only get you so far. And if you want to uh, make a big step in becoming more competitive, more, becoming more adaptable, you'll also have to reconsider your, your organization design decisions that might no longer be in line with your new goal of being an adaptable organization. So that's one, one take into, into the team's perspective. But there are many others we can take. Maybe you have a preference, uh, John, <laughs> that you wanna, want me to elaborate on. Uh, well, maybe we can kind of get into that because the number of backlogs seems to be a big issue for teams. And a lot of places that I go to, People seem to understand that they should reduce the number of backlogs, as in they, they seem to intellectually get that if you, for example, in your team, and so let's say your team and my team are in the same product, and your team is working on something that's worth $500 million, and you're you're, ha you're, you're thinking about doing the $450 million item, but actually you don't have capacity in your team because you're working on the $500 million item. And I'm working on the $1 million item over here. I'm thinking of working on the half a million dollar item because that's all I can see. That's my little world and that's what I see. Even though it's, it doesn't seem efficient for me to help your team because my team has no clue how to do the work in your team. Your work is 500 to 1,000 times more valuable than what I'm working on. And it actually makes a lot of sense for me, my team, to start that work and learn it and maybe get mentored by your guys. And a lot of people seem to get this intellectually 
and then it's almost like this learned helplessness where people just kind of shrug their shoulders and you know this is accept you know that we've got product owners all over the place product backlogs all over the place no real sense of the product and so i'm kind of curious to hear how you manage to convince clients to make that decision because a lot of people actually get that there is a problem but then kind of doing something about it is a different matter do you know what i mean mm -hmm. i think there are two aspects to this uh, and uh, and one is indeed do we realize that we are actually working on stuff that is not uh, the most important thing to work on in your example we have these two teams uh, so do we understand that assuming intellectually we understand this that one team is working on 50 million stuff and the other one is working on 10 times more valuable stuff then i think that's a, a one of the key steps to take if you understand really understand that then the second part is are we willing to really do something about that and in my experience management is very easy about that they say well of course we want to do something about that so in my experience the management part the leadership part is the easy part they say well of course you know i if i have 20 teams and goal a is the most important goal i, I, I want to put all my teams working on goal a i don't want only two teams to work on goal a and the other 18 teams work on lower value goals because you know they just can't so this is easy to convince or it's not convincing it's just making them aware leadership aware of doing that the hard part is the team so we have these highly intellectual people highly studied people and uh, that specialize and were incentivized over the years to specialize in a certain area or a certain skill or certain technology and i was saying to them you know uh, thank you for all of that but you know why don't you start working on stuff that you are not very good at <laughs> at the moment and leave all your years of investment in learning about skill a and, and replace that for skill b i think that's the most that's in my experience the hardest challenge to attack and there are a couple of ways to do that i think one important one is to ensure that people get the same kind of recognition so if you were a star before and you had a lot of social recognition by your teams of course you had final financial recognition too but let's skip that but you had social recognition by your team and by your peers so how can you ensure that you still have that if you move on and become like a media or a junior in a new kind of skill how can we ensure that uh, this is motivating for you and i think that's where the challenge lies and this has to do again with ensuring that this person maybe can take on a mental role for the skill he is already an expert in as so he gets this recognition still but then also has the ability in the in the room to learn a new skill and then combine those two expertises junior and senior and find a way a path forward to that and i think that's a big challenge to address and in my experience a very important one indeed yeah it's specialism people seem to think it's obvious that the specialist should do work and things and and what uh, takes a little bit of education is that sometimes effectiveness is maybe something that needs to be needs a bit more focus and then you can once you once you're doing the right stuff you can kind of get your efficiency sorted and your sustainability sorted so it's kind of interesting how people kind of push back of that with a, an efficiency argument when actual actually in terms of effectiveness and cost overall we're actually overall better as an organization so there's a bit of mm -hmm. a hearts and minds job to be done there all right and it's, and it's good to hear that you're not having any issues at exec levels with that well and not so much not so much so many issues as you have with teams uh, no sorry. teams is, is a harder problem and and, and i want to point out efficiency is a difficult or that's not difficult but it's a a term that uh, it can be a little bit confusing as uh, i always ask when people talk about efficiency i always ask which efficiency do you really mean that Hmm. Is it about like resource efficiency or is it about learning like flow efficiency? Hmm. And these are two different kinds of things. And the one the flow efficiency and, and resource efficiency, they don't really like each other. <laughs> you see? Yeah. And, and if you want to be fast and flexible, you should choose a lot of times a flow efficiency over, over resource efficiency. And again, intellectually, this is simple, but for a person, this is hard, you see, <laughs> you know, because I feel good doing things I'm good at. And I, I, normally people feel a little bit more uncomfortable doing things they're not very good at. So yeah. th this is a, this is the coaching. Th this is where coaching comes in. 
the point I want to make is, if you don't have the leadership support to do this, right, then it doesn't help. Any coaching doesn't help. You can use all the sticky notes or all the group hooks or all the sing kumbaya. It will not work. Yeah. If you have the leadership support and you have this intellectual understanding, then coaching becomes an option that can actually work. But without the leadership support, it's a, it's a no use because it's still constrained. You can coach all you want. Yeah, I often hear uh, debates as well about should we, because uh, uh, org design is essentially what the book is about and about making sure that the organization is, is designed for ease of delivery rather than ease of management. So basically we're, we're structured in the right way. We've got the teams who can actually get stuff moving and so on. And then you get people who say, well, actually, uh, that just causes chaos and we should just restructure boards around the work and let people, let there be a kind of a virtual organization that's kind of trying to manage through some boards or whatever to try and say, okay, this is what's going on, but people are still in the structure that they're all already in. What you have to say to people like that who say, well, you, you don't actually need to change the structure, that that can be too dramatic for the organization. The first thing is that I want to say is structure is just one thing. You have to worry about. There are others like incentives, <laughs> like the people you want to hire, or like the processes you use, like the objectives you want to achieve as your organization. But talking only about structure, if you have a structure in which your team has a different manager that he or she reports to, and I have a, I work in a team, I report to a different manager, and let's say you have in large scale, we have 20 of those teams or 100 of those teams, then the chances that these managers have conflicting priorities is increases with the number of teams. And then the chances that we are working out of sync increases also, you see. Even though we do QBRs or even though we, we have OKRs, you see, when they are cascaded down, the more you have of them, the higher the chances that we are have different interpretations of them uh, and different interpretations about how to implement them. And if we have different skills and we work in report to different managers, this, this is only increased. So these are all things that might, and in my experience, do get in the way of being an organization that can actually react to each other and react to the customer demand and deliver stuff fast because of these conflicting goals, because of these decisions made by individual managers or individual teams, which are best for them locally, but not necessarily best for the group as a whole. And structure, in that sense, plays an important role in these problems. By redefining the structure, by incorporating the teams that are, or let's call it the teams, the teams that are required to create a, and sustain a product, this would resolve lots of these unnecessary coordination, lots of these unnecessary conflicting goals, and make your organization much faster and flexible. And it's very hard to do that if you keep the structure intact. Indeed. Yeah, thank you very much. And so in terms of organization design, then, I'm, I'm guessing that in your book, you're really more aimed at product development, right, rather than anything else. And... That begs the question, what is a product? I quite like what I think I learned from Greg Lerman. Your product, it, it's probably something that an external customer or end user would, would recognize. And, and then I kind of added on my own little bit then. And maybe they pay for it with their money or their data. Um, mm -hmm. Although an end user probably wouldn't. In the, the complexity guide, I came up with a better definition of that. So it's, it's kind of interesting when I give product owner classes and, and then I discover, or people in the class discover that they don't own products. <laughs> they might own platforms or they might own components. Or, I mean, they're, they're, they are interested in the long term, to be fair, rather than the short term. But still, there's a kind of a lack of understanding there about product. And I, I'm curious what, what your angle is on, on product, uh, Cesario. Hmm. What would your advice be to people when they're trying to figure out what your product is? Yeah, absolutely. So so I just want to point out uh, first, before I talk about the product, that we talk, we use the word product a lot in the in the book, but the product and the surface, a surface, like for us, this is just an academic distinction. And I want, just want to point that out. A product is a, when you have to talk about a product, then it's always the same for every consumer, for every user. And uh, the difference with the surface is that it's not the same for every user because it depends on if it's a call center providing 
a part of the service, then it depends on who picks up the phone, right? So I, I just want to point that out. And furthermore, a lot of things in the book apply for a, a company which has a strategic focus, like we call it a product strategic focus. But it also applies for if you have an operational focus or a customer-centric focus. So the variability or, let's say, the adaptability requirements just differ. If in a product-centric organization, it's more about being fast, being first in the market, being able to adapt on feedback and making new features available, etc. Yeah, but uh, operational, it's more it's more standardized to work if you have an operational focus. But then the adaptability is more on changes in volume that you have to process. Now, for example, if you are a bank and you have to do, or an insurance company, you have to process claims, then you see you, the variability is not in, well, uh, we have a lot of different types of claims. It's more in the volume of the claims. So in the book, we actually talk about that, about all these three types. But let's get back to your question. So what is a product? In our context, products are not developed by one team most of the time, which is a pity. If a product is developed by one team, well, that's the optimal situation. It's, they are developed in, in large corporations with lots of teams, 10, 20, 50 teams. And then the problem becomes that these teams in this large context can easily be disconnected from end user value from actual, actually knowing who the end user is, actually knowing what problems they're solving. And therefore, we use this very, I think, formal definition of a product, which we say, well, if the thing you work on that you currently think is about is a product, uh, then it must have these characteristics, like it must have users which are from flesh and blood, which are humans. <laughs> you see, if the thing you work on doesn't have any users that are from flesh and blood, it's probably not a product. Then we say, well, it also, the thing you work on, it also needs to solve a need or a, a satisfy a need or solve a problem for these users. So if it doesn't have any users and it doesn't solve any need or problem, it's very unlikely to be a pro product. And then we say, well, it also needs to have some kind of business model, some kind of way to make money of it. And, and we don't mean monopoly money, money within the organization, but we mean external money. So if it doesn't have any users, it doesn't solve any needs or problems, and it doesn't have a business model, a way to make money, it's very, very unlikely to be a product, right? And then we say, well, it also needs to offer features or functionality. Now, if the thing you work on doesn't have any of these four, it's very, very unlikely to, have, to be a product. Stronger, we have never seen a product that didn't have all these four characteristics. So if you think you work on a product and you can just do the checks, users, it must solve needs and or problems, it must have a business model, and it must offer features to solve these needs to these users so that they are willing to pay money for it. If these four things do not exist, it's very unlikely that you work on a product, and instead you are working on part of a product. So then the challenge is to ask the question, if you work on part of a product, what am I a part of? By repeating that question, you will find a larger whole, a larger unit, a larger group of teams in this case, that actually checks check all the boxes. And that would be your product. So it could be in the insurance company, it might be the insurance policy type or something like that, or commercial insurance or retail insurance or house insurance. Yeah, you could think about it that way, but this has a, has a danger. It's like the insurance itself would be a paper or something or an agreement. Like, yeah. well, we have this agreement. Well, yeah. well, that's not the product. The, because why is this not a product? Because I cannot interact with this. Yeah. There's no features here. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah, is just yeah. part of the product. So the product would be, if I would sit back, let's say it's a digital product, like an insurance company, I would sit back my laptop and I could interact with it. So I could make a claim. I could, how is my claim being processed? Well, how about my own risk? What are the payments I made? I could call the help desk. I could say, well, I want to print out of all my, I don't know, declarations and so on. You see? So there is this interaction that you as an end user have to do in order that your problems are solved. So for the insurance thing, the policy would be part of the product because this is an output of that. 
but it would, it would also be the web interface would be part of that. Maybe via the telephone would be part of that, and the uh, help desk would be part of that, and it would also have different users which would work internally in the insurance company. They would need to access the product to handle my claim, do all kinds of stuff. So by identifying the users and their needs, by identifying the, the business model, and by following what needs to be done for me as a user to actually, what needs to be done by the product organizations or the insurance organization in this case, to satisfy my needs, we will identify the elements in the organization that are part of the product. So can I make it more concrete? Let's say that I can access the insurance policy product via my laptop, right? And so there's this web page and I say, well, I want to make a claim. Then the web interface, it's not enough. It's not the product. Because the web interface, for me to make a claim, would need to access some backend system, some backend technologies like, I don't know, you, people can imagine what, what this would be. Mainframes maybe, or I don't know, workflow management systems. Document systems. Document systems. So imagine that this feature doesn't exist yet, the feature of making a claim. Then you can study. Let's imagine we have to make this feature make a claim. Which of these elements like document system, mainframe and so on, need to do something, configure, program, develop, change, implement stuff for this feature. So you will find a couple of these elements. And then you can say, well, let's do it with another feature, another feature, another feature. And if you keep doing that, you will identify a set of organizational elements or end processes that you need most of the time. And this will give you the first indication of what elements are part of your product. And you mentioned three models. You mentioned product and you mentioned operational. What's the third one? It's customer. So there are three strategic foci. There are more, but the, the classical three are you, are you either have a strategic focus on product or a strategic focus on operations that we know from Six Sigma and efficiency and so on. Or you have one which is customer centric, which we know from, for example, from consultancies, where we built a whole group just surfacing bank A. We have a whole unit in our consultancy that services only bank A. You know, we are customer intimate. If they say jump, we jump, right? <laughs> That's very different from operational, which is about standard. We don't have to be the best in class we just have to we have different metrics also which is cost per transaction for example would be one and then you have the product which is about well being fast being early being first to market and so on and these foci tune make detailed tunements in what it means for you to be an adaptable organization so there is you cannot be adaptable for all kinds of foci in the same way and that's, of course, the challenge that we describe in the book, but that you have to discover. So if you were to summarize, let's say, I'm guessing for operational, you need to maybe optimize for efficiency and sustainability. Uh, yes. I guess for product, you're probably optimizing for effectiveness, capability, and then efficiency and sustainability afterwards. But the first two, you need to have the capability and you need to be able to do the right things, delivering the right features and so on. What would be the focus in the customer-centric one? So let's say that you make a product for only one customer. Yeah. So then it would be, well, whatever this customer wants, we must be prepared to react to that as fast as we can. So we must be really, really intimate with them. We must really, really understand their business. We must be working with them maybe daily, right? So we need, really can react to their specific demands. That would be an example of a customer-centric focus. Uh, thank you, Cesare. That's very, very helpful. So for the people listening, just kind of drilling into your book, and if we look at where you talk about, well, basically you talk about what is a product, but also what, where do these former people who thought they were product owners now go when you've, when you've now discovered what the real product is? So let's say you've discovered that you just gave a very good example there for insurance where it's kind of an all-encompassing suite of stuff really to deal with all different angles in terms of customer experience in relation to those pieces of paper that come out at the end of the day. And so 
is you've got people who are product owners, but then they discover that actually, well, we should have less backlogs. And so how have you dealt with this change? Because some people would say that there's a weed in Ireland, it's known as Japanese knotweed, and it's very difficult to get rid of it if you get it into your garden. It's no <laughs> reflection of the Japanese. Japanese are lovely people. It just happens to be called Japanese knotweed, the, the weed. And what happens is if you try to cut it, it grows even stronger. And, <laughs> And some people think that when you have all the product owners in place, it's quite difficult to kind of move the organization to a place where actually there's one product owner. And I know you've had a number of case studies in this. So what's your experience been, Cesario, in dealing with this? This is a hard, a hard problem. And this is a bit of hard, like on the management level and a lot harder, again, on the person level, on the product owner person level. And I've had situations where leadership would say, well, we just tell them and that's it. It's end of product owner. There's no more product owner role at the team level. Let's go and tell them. <laughs> and other teams would say, management team would say, well, you know, this is too, too strong and we don't want that. And they would have a more gentle approach. And both can work. Both can work. One way that can work that we, that I tried and, and, and worked sometimes would be then we would say, well, okay, you can still be called. So these people can still be called product owner, but everybody knows, and they also know that they don't own anything except part of a product. At least they work on part of a product. They don't even own that because there's always one person above them or, or that would say, well, I want you to work on this and that's it. So they would not have the authority to any, to make real priority decisions. So they, and they, and they know that. And then you could say, well, we'll just leave that. We just leave them in the, with the name product owner. That's not a problem. But what we do is we now take away their backlog. So there's no more team backlogs now. There's only a product backlog now. And you are still the product owner and you still have to do what you already did, which was probably not product owner work, which was probably business analysis, requirements, engineering all the time. So you still need to do that in your team. <laughs> and then in my experience, this is easier to manage to coach. After a few sprints or uh, sometimes even after the first sprint, they realize that it's just bogus. It's just doesn't make any sense to be called a product owner anymore. And I've even seen in, in one large bank that all the product owners would voluntarily say it after one sprint, it doesn't make any sense. Please don't call us product owner anymore. <laughs> That's, that's one way to do it. For them, nothing changes except they don't have a product backlog anymore, which is their own, let, let's say. That's one way to do it. So basically, what they become is, they become a team member, which they already were. They can have lunch with the team and so on, also, which were, they would not be able to do before. So, so I, I say, well, this is actually a promotion, you see. Now you're not between the real product owner and the teams anymore. Now you're just, you found the home base. You're now part, part of a team, which, would make you feel more comfortable. The other one is, is the more radical one, where we just say, well, this product owner role just doesn't exist anymore. And that's it. We, the people who pay salaries, we had this discussion with you, with the teams. We agreed that we want, what we want to do is we want to be more adaptable. The intellectual reason, intellectual step, one of the intellectual steps to do is to reduce the number of product backlogs. And we had 18 of them. So the first step, we're going to have only 10. So product order 11 to 18, you don't have a product backlog anymore starting next week. And okay, you know, here we have, well, you know, let's work on that together. Let's see what we can do that you can keep your status, that you can keep your social recognition. And that's it. Yeah. That sounds really good. I like the mantra of promote, promoting a product owner to be a team member. I don't think it's a cheeky one-liner. I think it's true. Because a lot of people who aren't real product owners, they're expected to write perfect product backlog items and hand them to the team. And actually, that's kind of devaluing the effort that the, t the developers need to put into actually understanding the work as well. I like Russell Ackles' one-liner, the more right you do the wrong thing, the, the more wrong you become. And so people intellectually get that as well, but they like the idea of someone else kind of farming them the, uh, the perfect items. Say, no, you can't bring it in because it's not ready. And they don't realize that actually in sprint planning, in Scrum, for example, it's still last chance alone in Scrum planning to actually refine the item. Like so, mm -hmm. and they should have been all doing it together anyway in refinement. So, I, I really do like that's a really good take on it. I really like the way you do that, and, and I love the way you describe it as well. I, I, I imagine you must be a very enjoyable 
person to work with so relaxed and very kind of easy to understand and so on. So I'm really enjoying the way you explain things here. So basically, if you have a situation where we're thinking about changing the structure, we already said one of the things you do is you get rid of the backlogs, which automatically has an effect on the structure, whether it happens directly or indirectly, the way you mentioned it. Mindset is something that came up in the book. And I don't know, I have a little bit of a kind of a love-hate relationship with mindset. I have to give you, uh, make a confession here, Cesario, because for me, mindset isn't observable. You know, I, I don't know how you're thinking. Do you know what I mean? But I can just see how you're behaving kind of thing. But I think I know what you meant when you were talking about mindset. But this whole relationship between structure processes, tools, mindset, the way sometimes you... Sometimes you might need to wait until people are ready to believe in things before you can actually change the structure. And then other times you change the structure, you can work on the mindset later. Can you summarize for listeners what your overall take is on mindset in, in the book, Cesario? Mindset, I think it starts with, when you talk about organization design, you need to think about uh, what kind of people are we actually hiring? What kind of mindset? Do we want, what kind of behaviors do we want the people to show? And this starts with the hiring policy and with your interviews and you can, with your assessments if you have those. And the, the other aspect is how are we going to then reward people? Are we going to reward teamwork or individual work or a mix of that? How are targets set? How is bon how are bonuses set? Is it on team success, product success, individual success? So all these things, apart from the structure, influence mindset. Another thing I think is important, especially if you work in technology and software, for example, these the technologies are changing very rapidly. I was a developer for many years, and it changed super rapidly. And it changes even faster now, I think. So if the mindset is not, if you have what we call a fixed mindset, it will be very hard to deal with that. And in an agile organization, it's not only technology, it's also domain, it's also customers and so on. So you must be able and feeling comfortable unlearning stuff and learning new stuff. And I think that is important and that is part of the mindset that we, we talk about in the book. So far as I understand, a part of that you can actually train and support and coach. And part of that is just part of who you are. But the mindset should be yeah, a mindset in which you are willing to cooperate in teams, willing to learn and, and discover new technologies, work in new domains, and being more or less comfortable in, in making mistakes and learning from that. I think that's what we talk about in the book. Yeah, thank you very much, Cesario. Cesario, regardless of whether it's uh, you're dealing with a product or whether it's an operational setup or whether it's uh, customer-centric, and sometimes you might have a mix of all three. Absolutely. Big enough organization, right? So the bane of delivery really is dependencies between teams. It's like I teach a class, I think you do as well, on Nexus, and it's just a, it's like Les's little brother, and it kind of, um, he kind of deals with, if you have what I call layer of cake teams, you're going to have dependencies, you know, front-end, midware, back-end, that type of thing, and, and it's, it's only when you have slice of cake teams really that you kind of, you can deliver uh, what you need to do, and you can... Okay, you can you can have stable teams with all the skills like SDK teams, or you could do authentic dynamic re teaming to swarm together on some work together at the same sprint, so you can kind of work on things and you can kind of get things out of the way, and you can you have to be deliberate and intentional about doing that. People do struggle on, but what they notice very quickly is that they're not delivering work in the order of value; they're delivering work in the order that the dependencies. They can get to make sense that people can actually model true. I'm just wondering how hard was it for, for you to, to get your customers, to get your clients to see that dependencies between teams are the kind of the bane, the asynchronous ones, you know, the ones where I have to do one thing before another thing can start. I don't mean the ones where you can get actually work together and smash through it. The ones where they're kind of asynchronous, they're the kind of the bane of delivery, if you like. Curious how you've managed to work with customers to help see that this is a problem. So dependencies is a, a big, very big topic. We talk about that in the book a lot. It's all about dependencies it's between units. A yeah. team, is, a team is a unit in this case. And, and there are many types of dependencies. But let's, get, let's focus on your question. And the question was, how can you talk about, how can you convince 
people, right? So I can give you an example. So there was this organization and they were developing a, a, a large product. It was a banking product. And they had 18 teams or something, or 20 teams, I don't remember, around 20 teams. And the director of this product was not very happy because it was very unpredictable when things would be done. And she needed, she just, she didn't care that it was late. She just wanted it to be like, can you give me some kind of reliable date because I have to show accountability to my board. <laughs> So we did a study, call it a GOSI, and we found out that they had indeed 18 product backlog and 15, it was a code, coding, programming product. That's 15 or 16 code branches. And they had all these dependencies between them to create an end-to-end -end feature. And this would then blow up during integration and final testing. So by making that transparent and showing that, we would get insights into these conflicts, these code conflicts, these functional conflicts, earlier on, we would have more time to do something about that. This is the simplest form of a dependency, which is a asynchronous dependency. We're making them synchronous by removing the code repository so that everybody would integrate more often and therefore would be able to test more often. And of course, if you integrate more often and test more often, your end and more of the total number of lines of code are tested and integrated, uh, then the result would will be most of the time that you have a better understanding of where you are. And that was intellectually easily understood. So we started over time reducing the branches or the individual repositories to 17, to 15, to 5, to 2. We stayed at 2, a release one and a development one. Right. So that would be that would be one way to 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 focus on these two type of dependencies you mentioned. But there are many others, and in the book we talk about reciprocal dependencies, which is dependencies that are reciprocal. <laughs> so we must contain them in the same unit. Then there are sequential dependencies, which are could be less uncertain. And if you have to choose between reciprocal dependency and uh, sequential dependency, I mean, if you have to choose to put them inside your unit, you would, of course, favor reciprocal dependencies over sequential. And then there are dependencies between units. But these are not on task level, like we are talking about until now. These are not task level dependencies. These are about function dependencies, like what is the function that I assign to a department, like you are the finance department or you are the Billing department. So that could be coupling between these functions. So these new, if they are, if they are coupled, we need to resolve them also. So dependency is a very big topic and it's super important. Zario, thank you so much for coming on the Exigility podcast. It's an absolute pleasure. And I wish you all the best with the book. It's a very good read and highly recommend this to the audience as well. Thanks a lot, John. It was very nice talking to you. You're very relaxed. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks.